All right, and we are live. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our Hangout on Air today. My name is Lucille Lamb. I am head of talent here at Stride. We are an agile development consulting firm based in New York City. And I'm super excited and proud to be hosting this Hangout panel here today. Um, got an amazing panel of experts um, with me here. We're going to be talking about TDD principles and practices. Um, so we'll have a 30-minute conversation around test-driven development and then open up for a live Q&A from the audience. So if you've got questions you'd like to ask the panel, definitely feel free to chime in via the YouTube comments or the Google Plus Q&A app. Um, at 11.30, I'll be taking those questions and sharing them with our panel here. So yeah, let's kick it off. I'd love to introduce you to our host today, Aldrich Giacomoni, who is a lead software consultant here at Stride. So Aldrich, if you want to kick it off by giving a, a brief introduction, background on yourself, and then, um, and then we'll get the rest of the panel uh, to introduce them. <coughs> we'll go in this order, Ariel, Bob, Conrad, David, and Moss. And then, um, and then Aldrich can take the mic back from there and um, kick off the discussion. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Aldrich, and I'm a software developer at Stride. I decided that I would get into computers around the age of nine when I destroyed one of my computer's motherboards, uh, and I thought it was fascinating. Uh, I went to college for computer science and then realized that it had nothing to do with programming or anything that looked like computers. Uh, so I got into IT and then realized I didn't want to work with computers, I wanted to work with good people. Uh, so I taught myself to write code, and uh, seven or eight years later, here I am. Awesome. Ariel. Um, Lucille, as you said, my name's Ariel. I work for Gust as a principal software engineer. Uh, got bit by that bug, the test driven development bug, maybe 2004 uh, ish. Uh, I've had the distinct pleasure of pairing with all the other panelists today. Um, so I've had quite a rich experience, and I'm very grateful uh, for my experience up to this point. And I continue, you know, continue to learn every day. So I'm excited to have this conversation with uh, my friends. Nice, Bob. Hi, uh, my name is Bob Nadler. Um, I also work for Gust as a principal software engineer. Um, I started looking into TDD, I guess, yeah, uh, around 2004, 2005, uh, while I was working as a uh, .NET developer, um, and uh, you know, kind of fell in love with it, and uh, been Try to practice it ever since. Conrad. All right, so I'm Conrad Benham, uh, principal consultant at Stride. Um, I've been uh, TDDing and doing XP uh, since around 2002, um, out of my first job um, back in Australia at a domain name registrar. Um, and at Stride, I lead teams and help clients get better at what they do. Awesome. Got David. Hi, I'm David Newell. I'm a software developer at TapEd, focusing mostly on the UX and front end development. I remember the first time I completed a project using all TDD. And at the end, we looked and we're like, wait, are we done? Uh, the test passed. And there's no more tests to write. We must be. All right, and we've got Moss. Hi, uh, I'm Moss, uh, Moss Column. I'm a, a lead software architect at a place called Luminoso. Um, I, I think I joined the long list of people that got into TDD somewhere around 2004. Um, and it's an interesting topic for me to be talking about right now because I've just started kind of introducing some of the people I work with to uh, doing TDD and um, finding some interesting challenges with kind of TDD when you're doing weird, not totally deterministic machine learning -y stuff. Anyway, that's me. Thanks for your introductions, guys. Um, so Aldrich's got a few questions um, that will kick off the discussion here today. I'll kick it to you, Aldrich. Yeah, so today we want to talk about uh, TDD. It's actually very timely since about a week ago, uh, a blog entry on somebody giving up TDD went around the internet very quickly. Um, and so I thought we would begin by 
why do we do TDD? What value does it deliver? Uh, and after that, when would we not do it? So what value does TDD give us? Who wants to go first? Ariel? I was going to say, go ahead, Moss. Yeah. All right, Moss. Uh, OK. Um, I guess I think the big thing it gives me is that um, I've got sort of constant feedback on when I'm making progress. Like if I'm just sort of, if I just sort of take the sit down and try to code something approach, I I have a hard time actually noticing that I can get stuck. Like I'll get stuck on something, but that doesn't manifest as getting stuck. It manifests as like, oh well, first I need to figure out this, but then I need to figure out this, but then I need to figure out this other thing, and then like three hours later I look up and realize that I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, whereas with TDD, I can sort of I get into this nice little rhythm of like, all right, I'm making I'm writing a test, I'm writing some code to make it pass, bump, 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 and then if I miss a few beats, I can sort of notice, oh, when's the last time I made a test pass? Is there something I didn't understand here? Maybe I need to back up and think a little more. <laughs> I think for me, I mean, it's almost the same experience as Moss um, has with test driven development. Um, and I think for me, it's just really that sense of direction, the sense of accomplishment, and just feeling more confident as we go along in the project. Um, I think for me, I, I look at test driven development, I'm I want to say like I'm in between a mockist and a or you know a London guy and a um, a classic guy, a Detroit style uh, programmer. So I'm I lie somewhere in between there. I use different techniques when it suits me, <laughs> um, but for the most part, it's like I just take it step by step as much as I can, and I try to let the test kind of let me know that something is wrong. Um, I think that that's where I find the most value in the test, where it's like, hey, look, we're trying to put this test together. If we can't put this test together, something's wrong. Maybe we don't understand this problem. And I think uh, Moss hit that nail on the head, feedback being one of the core principles of extreme programming. That is what test driven development gives me, that feedback, the confidence, the desire to explore more, and then to know when I'm done. You know, David mentioned in his uh, intro it's like, hey, look, are we finished with whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish? It's like there's this line, then it's like, well, if I can't think of anything else, maybe this is a stopping point. You know, it doesn't mean that it's the end and you're really done, done. But it's like, you know, you, at least you, it's like that little checklist that you check off um, and to let you know that at least all the things that you thought about, you're done with. And you have the confidence that they'll work. Anybody else? Oh, come right. I think for me, um, you know, Moss and, and Ariel captured it. Um, it's it's about being able to fail fast, I think, and about being able to know when you're on on track with functionality that you're building. Um, and as Ariel, uh, sorry, as Moss was saying earlier, um, without I find without tests, it's hard to really gain a direction and and gain some focus on what's being built. So. I find that uh, test-driven development um, really enables uh, short feedback loops, uh, being able to understand that um, starting off with something simple enables you to build on uh, to, to come up with a, a more complex solution over time and knowing that things that you'd built you know, an hour or two hours ago still work, um, even you know, going on into the future. So I think that you know, test-driven development uh, aids design and as a part of that um, also helps with uh, knowing that you're not regressing way into the future, an hour, two hours, years later. Um, so, um, and I think that that's, that's one of the, the strong things that's kind of overlooked is uh, the, the way that it may, uh, aids design. Um, for me, the design of a software system um, becomes very different when you test, test, test drive its development 
versus when you just co cobble things together without any tests. Um, I find that uh, the objects that I, or the sorry, the classes that I create tend to be smaller and uh, more focused on doing one thing at a time and doing it really well. Um, and by having tests, my future self can be confident that my former self um, got the tests right and can therefore forget about things that have already been written. Um, so they're some of the things that I find very useful about test-driven development. Ariel, something to add? No, I, I was going to ask a question, which is, um, I think we all have the same understanding of like what we think test-driven development is, and I, I think where it's like the process of test-driven development, the sort of like the ritual that I think it's um, Bob Martin refers to, which is like, hey, write an example. Here's a little bit of code that's going to execute for a particular scenario, use case, whatever, very focused on a component. Make sure when you run the test that you have some assertions, some expectations to say like, hey, this is what I think should happen, or this is what the result should be. Um, it should fail, and it should fail for the reason that you know, that you think, right? It's like, hey, look, if I expected this thing to return this value, that value better be this value. And then it'll fail and tell you, hey, look, this is not right. Then you go ahead and then you write some code so that that test passes and no other test around it break as you're building up the test. So it's like one test at a time. It's like, hey, one example at a time. Then you write it. And then once you make the test pass, you can make some changes to make the test look nicer, which we often refer to as refactoring. Right, the the code, the production code, and the test case. I just want to make that make it sure that everybody here has that same. Uh, that's their definition of test driven development, um, as far as micro testing is concerned. Does anybody have something different in mind when they're talking about? I think I see assent. Um, so I'd like to move on a little bit. Uh, mostly because we have very limited time. Uh, so given all the value that uh, TDD delivers, when would uh, a developer or a team or a company choose not to do TDD, and when would that be the right decision? Who wants to go first? Uh, David? You know, being a front-end developer, it's hard to test drive the design process. Because on your normal code, when you're writing a unit test, you can write the test as soon as you've decided on a name, the inputs, and the output. You only have to write them down as long as you've decided on it. But on the front end, I don't know if I need an anchor, only a link. Maybe I'm redirecting to a new page, or I'm staying on the same page and modifying something. And so I need to try these out and think about what the user wants before I can write a test for it. And it's hard to test that the user experience is the correct way to go about it. Did you see Conrad's question? Yeah, so we do, our, my work is mostly in web design. So um, front end HTML, a lot of interactive pages. Ariel, you have something to add? I was going to say probably solution spikes, like when you're just trying to kind of just try out some library because you're just interested in seeing how it works. You know, you it's not strictly touch on development. It's not like, hey, look, I've got a use case. I'm going to make it pass or whatever. You're just kind of uh, futzing around, trying out a library. Um, a lot of times people who have languages that include REPLs will use REPLs to kind of explore um, for exploratory testing, you know? Like, you're just kind of digging around, trying to see what's going on. You're not, in that case, you know, you're, you're putting together a sort of a test charter, but you're not automating every single step when you're trying to figure out what can break in the system. That's an interesting one, Ariel. Um, I, I've, I've, I really love REPLs. I think they're very powerful. Um, I've also found even tests, even doing... I mean, I wouldn't even call it TDD at this point, I think, but I have found it helpful to even 
write unit tests even when spiking to run a library. Um, because in some cases, like there can be a, a significant amount of setup um, that I find that using a test can help with. Um, but I, yeah, I, I generally agree with you that when uh, trying to learn a library, it, it's often helpful not to do TDD. Um, but I guess a different variant might be actually using the test harness to explore the, the library. So good, good point. David? Yeah, building on what Conrad said, even a very simple test that you write at the start, you're expecting it to fail in a certain way. So if I'm using a new library or a new language, a lot of times it will fail not how I meant for it to fail. And that tells me a lot. Moss? Um, an interesting one I've been seeing lately is I, I have a couple of coworkers who spend a lot of their time kind of working with libraries that parse natural language and trying to kind of tune their performance to do as good a job as they can. Um, and that's the kind of thing where you you can't really have something that works completely correctly because <laughs> it's not a problem that has been solved remotely that well. It's more a matter of like finding something that works kind of better or worse than other ways of tuning it. Um, and I feel like that poses some interesting challenges for TDD because it's sort of you can't just nail down, all right, it has to work exactly right for this set of cases. It's a matter of sort of looking over the cases you want to match and seeing how how good a fit you can get for everything, knowing that you're going to be missing some things. Um. Nice. Are you? Yeah, I, I know I'm speaking a lot, but it's like I, I think it comes down to things that slow feedback down. So if it's faster for you to do something and it's always faster than it is for you to automate it, to do it manually, then just do it manually. You know, if the feedback loop slows you down, preventing you from making any progress, then, like, I, looking at it from the perspective of, like, hey, look, write a test that, that's going to make this fail, write some code to make it pass, write a test, it, it's like, I, I'm not sure, I don't know, there's some activities that maybe don't fall into that category. Because it's like, hey, look, would I, would I test drive if I'm at a bash command line and I'm just writing a little script that needs to find all the files in the directory named this? Am I going to TDD it? Am I going to like now set up a testing harness to kind of just do find dash name, you know, <laughs> whatever? Um, probably not, you know? So... I, I guess fundamentally it comes down to is this code you're going to keep? Do you have to maintain this and get back to it later? If so, it's probably good to use TDD on it. Um, but that leads to the next question, which is so how do you how do you do good TDD? Um, a couple of years ago, I started calling it test-driven design and not development to try and explain to people what I really intended the, the exercise to be. So how do you use TDD and help it get to good design for your system. Anybody? Conrad. Yeah, so um, for me, TDD is, uh, is a really powerful tool um, that I think supplement, or complements, rather, uh, a number of other um, practices that I like to use or principles. Um, they being uh, dependency injection um, in, a, in a statically typed language, um, design patterns, object orientation, um, and also top-down development versus bottom-up development. What I mean by that is starting at the user interface and allowing the user interface to guide what is needed to be built out um, as you go down the stack toward the database as opposed to starting at the database and then working your way up to the user interface. Um, so for me, test-driven development isn't just something that is used in isolation of other things. I think it's something that can be very powerful to help guide the design of a system. Um, but then there are other tools that I mentioned before 
uh, such as dependency injection and design patterns that can really help facilitate um, the building and construction of a robust system. Um, and I've, what I find with TDD is that it helps design and craft objects or classes that then themselves sort of become components of a system uh, that can be pulled together um, using dependency injection. Um, and that then, the, t the tests or the, that you get from TDD um, generally lend themselves very nicely to dependency injection because to set the, the, the objects that you create from the classes up, you tend to have to poke things in, such as mocks or stubs, um, which then makes it, lends itself very nicely to dependency injection. Thank you. Bob? Yeah, one thing I was going to say, uh, I remember back when I was first learning TDD, um, it took a long time for me to get to the point where I felt like TDD was helping with my design. Um, I think in the beginning, if, if you know, for somebody that's new to TDD, if you're just starting out, don't, uh, like, don't feel like, you know, if it's not helping with, with the way you design things, like, right away, uh, don't kind of get caught up in that, um, you know, just doing the, you know, the, the TDD cycle, you know, red-green refactor, um, uh, and getting used to that feedback loop, and eventually the design aspect comes a little bit later. Because um, I remember back when I was first learning about TDD, people were saying, oh, it helps with design, it helps with design, and when I first started doing it, I didn't quite get that because I was still too wrapped up into how does this, you know, the mechanics of it work and things like that. Um, so that would be one piece of advice I would give to somebody who's just starting out is don't think it's going to miraculously help with you know better design right away. Yeah, it's like once you develop that sensitivity to issues with the test suite, that's when you start questioning, am I doing this right? Like I, I think I agree. I don't know. My my experience is very similar to yours, Bob, in the sense that. When I first started doing test-driven development, I had designed my components first, and then I tried to prove that design by wrapping, by writing tests for that design. But it's kind of like I knew I wanted that design, and I was gonna jerk, like throw test and force my way, force that in there. And at some point, it was like the light bulb went off. And it was like, hey, that design is there, but it's just a rough draft. It's an idea that I want to achieve. But then using actual code examples to prove that it would work or not. Like that's a whole other thing. You know, Conrad talked about dependency injection and isolating components. It's like as I learned more about my growth testing, it was like, oh, that's inter that's interesting. Like I wrote this test and it's impossible to understand. So let's do something to make it make it easier to understand. Let's like break things apart. Let's make the test smaller and more focused. Um, those are it's incredible how how much shared experience we have there. I think. Uh, Moss, you were going to say something. Oh yeah, I, I was going to kind of adding on to what Bob was saying. Um, I, I feel like when we, when we hear that TDD is mostly about design. I feel like a lot of people's first reaction to that is to think that it's something that you do kind of instead of doing design. <laughs> Um, and then you get reactions like, well, hey, I tried TDDing this thing and not designing it, and I ended up with a like pile of messy code with a horrible design. But I think it's more some, something that where you sort of, it can become a feedback tool for your design. It, it helps you design, but you need to be thinking about design the whole time while you're TDDing and kind of see how how you learn to use the TDD process as input into the design process. Yeah, so that's that dovetails very nicely into that the next few questions that we're hopefully going to have time to get into. Uh, the next one directly is, how have you seen uh, TDD in some fashion lead to bad design? And David goes first. So I was working with someone who was just learning to be a developer, and we were trying to make tic-tac-toe. So a very simple game. But I wanted to 
TDD the, the game. And I started off, well, we need to get our spec for this, and we need to write our tests. And being very strict about, I will write the test, and then you make it pass. Now you write the test, and I'll make it pass. And after working for a little while, we ended up with, like Ma said, just a mess. I think there were two major problems from this. Um, first off, I was focusing on the tests themselves, kind of emphasizing that, as opposed to the project. And the tests are useful, but they're not, they are not the project themselves. They should help guide the project. But also, we didn't take time beforehand to figure out at least like what are the major systems here, what do we need to do, you know, explain, even if we all know what tic-tac-toe is, let's take a second to sit down and actually understand what it means as a program. Thanks. Comrade? Yeah, I think one of the things that um, TDD has uh, illuminated for me is the friction or the impedance mismatch that can exist with certain libraries. So if I've found that uh, if it's difficult to um, craft a system uh, and incorporate a third-party library, that it's generally because the third-party library doesn't lend itself to testing and uh, that the amount of setup that's required to incorporate that third-party library um, either by mocking or whatever can sometimes be impossible. So sometimes it's not even possible to do test-driven development when you're interfacing with a third-party library. Some techniques that I sometimes use to get around that would be to create some kind of um, abstraction layer that doesn't get tested but can, be, can itself be mocked, and therefore that layer um, is what is injected into the things that depend on it, um, and then you end up having an untested layer. Um, so I, I think it's when, when trying to TDD and, and as, a, as a new person coming to TDD, uh, if you do come across these situations, don't be disappointed or dismayed because even the uh, professionals who've been doing it for a long time can come up against these hard challenges too. Thanks. Um, Ariel? Um, I, I think there's a, quite a few things. Um, if the tests themselves are not very good, um, the tests are hard to understand. Like you know, we if we write a test suite that is just really poorly named um, test, very poor examples, lots of dependencies, thinking about too much in a single test case. Um, I mean, that's kind of just a reflection of your what your production code is going to be like. It's like you you know you have this 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 test case that is hundreds of lines long, and then you look at the code that you're trying to exercise, that is that reflection. You know, Conrad was talking about third-party libraries. It's like we are the, we are in the time of frameworks, and I think we're transitioning away. You know, we went from, from having frameworks to, oh my gosh, I hate frameworks, to back to frameworks, to, oh my goodness, now we have so many micro libraries that when one person pulls it out of a repository, then the whole universe happens. You know, it's like there's just so we're we're swinging the pendulum in so many different directions. And I think it's like, hey, look, if I've got this test that's really tightly coupled to all these other things, you know, it's like, and I'm letting that happen. You know, like I'm writing the test like that, and I'm like, well, you know, that's life. Or if I've a, a put together a test suite that takes hundreds of hours to run. You know, it's like, hey, I've just set myself up for frustration. You know, a small change that, hey, look, I just need to change some CSS. Ah, oh, but you got to wait for the build to finish. You know, we're, we have hampered ourselves. Um, and so it's like it, more than bad design, it's also just like pre preventing things from progressing along. So, you know, those are the kinds of things. And then there's, you know, there's all these test mills. If you look at the X unit, uh, testing patterns book. There's test smells in there, where even tests themselves just cause more problems than they than they add. If you if you have to know what you're doing, right? Effectively is what I'm trying to say. 
Um, so I think in those cases, test-driven development can lead to very poor design. Um, another very odd case is going to be performance, where it's like because I want to try to take this test case and I write a micro test case that's very focused on doing things um, that are not as performant as other solutions. Well, it's like, oh, hey, I wrote this test case and then I deployed this to production without um, the P of the right bicep and thinking about the performance considerations of my, my design, then it's like, hey, I just wrote a test that leads to bad functionality, bad performance, bad design. So I think those are a couple of ways, <laughs> a couple of things that TDD can uh, affect you negatively. Comrade, do you want to add something so much short? We have one last question I'd like to get to. Yeah, no, so, so I think if, if you find yourself fighting to write a test, it's possibly because it's not the right test to be uh, working on. Um, you know, I have definitely come across situations where I fight to add new tests, and then I, I have to think. It may, it's a point where I need to step back and think about what I'm doing. Sorry. Testing TDD should generally, in my experience, be something that comes without friction if, if doing it well. One thing that has made me very happy so far is that uh, most of us have mentioned uh, TDD, especially in the context of bringing the TDD to new people or helping people learn TDD. So um, how would one change their mindset to start using TDD? What allowances does one have to make? What are the pains you have to be prepared for? Anybody? Mueller? Bob. Uh, what I was going to say, at least in the beginning, be prepared to go a little bit slower than you're used to um, because you're going to be, um, you know, thinking a little bit about more about what you're trying to write, the code that you're trying to write, um, and you're going to be, your first few attempts at writing a test may be wrong, so you may start off writing a certain test with certain assertions and then get to a certain point and then realize this is the wrong test and then you know delete what you did or you know and start with a new test or something like that um, so at least in the beginning I would say be prepared for for, for that David? I think maybe when you're working with coworkers it takes a while to build that habit I was working with a coworker on a project a while ago, and we were on my computer, so I wrote the test first and then kind of pushed it over to him. And we were talking about this recently, and he's like, yeah, that was actually a good experience, even though he's not big on TDD. But I think because that was the only time we did that, the habit never built up. I see that Ariel decided to chat slash tweet something. Should be interesting. <laughs> Thanks. Do we have anything else to add, or is it time to move on to the Q and A? All right, hey. we can start. Oh, go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, up, boss. Oh, sorry. Um, I guess I, I just realized one thing worth adding is that um, a, a lot of kind of getting comfortable with test-driven development is learning the art of picking a next test to write that won't take too much new code to get there and kind of learning how to choose choose your steps carefully. Awesome. Audrey, did you want to say something? Nope, just passing the mic to you. Cool. We do have some questions from the audience live, so it's been a great conversation so far. Let's um, have our audience join us in the conversation. So we've got a question um, that is, what's the state of front-end test-driven development like? I know David touched on this, but um, what else do you guys have to add to, to this thought? So a lot of the frameworks are better than at test-driven development than others. Um, Look at your framework and see how they're how they handle testing. Like I said, the design part is hard to test drive, but you should try to separate out 
as much as you can the actual business logic from the interface and focus on the business logic and test that. And then once the design is set down, you can still go back and add tests to make sure that you don't introduce new features but, or introduce new bugs. There are uh, various perspectives. Uh, I've been using React a fair amount lately. And even on uh, the video that uh, Jim Short did two years ago in his Let's Code JavaScript, where he explored, um, he deplored that you couldn't just test the component. You had to render it, transform it into markup before you could do a comparison. And this is still not possible. So that doesn't seem to be something that they value uh, as a library as far as how to test it. Well, does anybody else have to add to that question? All right, well, we got another question that came in, which is, um, and I don't know how easy it is to answer this, but how common is TDD at product companies? So maybe you can speak from the perspective of the companies that you guys have seen. Um. I was going to say that that's hard to answer because I don't have a very limited, I guess, perspective. I've only worked at, what, eight or nine different companies and interacted with many people. So um, <clears throat> I would say everywhere where I go, I make sure that I bring test-driven development with me. That's the only way to really answer that. I've come to places where they don't have a test suite at all, and it's like, all right, well, let's add one. That's pretty much it. Um, uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, if the team is high functioning and they work well together and they derive value from it, they'll keep doing it. Mm -hmm. Teams that don't derive value from it or aren't working well together, um, they'll, you know, it'll, it'll turn into something that I think Martin Fowler refers to as test cancer, where it's like the suite just kind of sits there and nobody runs it. And then it's essentially just waste. So, I think it really depends on the teams, on the organization. Um, but I, I mean, I don't have any statistical data to tell you how you know prominent it is or not. In my experience, um, I've found a lot of companies that I've worked with don't necessarily practice TDD, but they do do unit tests. Um, which could mean that they're writing tests afterwards. It could mean that they're writing some tests before. Um, but I have found that uh, it's it's on the lower side than I would like to see. Um, and I think that that can stem from a number of things to people not being interested in, people feeling like they're brittle. Um, there are many different reasons that TDD is not practiced, um, but I would like to see that increase. Awesome. We have another question that's um, related to front end as well. How does back end TDD differ from front end TDD? Is it okay? I, I think I want to make a distinction between what people mean by front end and back end. I would assert that people are saying front end is whatever the like JavaScript frameworks or JavaScript libraries are doing on the f trying to create a UI, a rich UI, versus things that are running on the server. I'm going to operate under the assumption that's the <laughs> the question. Um, for me, I don't see a, a big distinction. Like I, if we're going to, you know, Bob and I work with React and we work with JavaScript, and what we do is that we write view tests for our React components and fight like crazy to get any logic, like I think it was David that said this, out of there and put them into um, our pipeline for our functions outside of that. And then import them a little bit <laughs> into our test cases and try to make the UI components dumb and then have <laughs> even more dumb model components or, or, or just functions that are just taking data coming from the server, if that's the separation that we're talking about. Um, so for us, it's kind of like no logic in the front end, no logic even in the components. Use hypermedia as the engine of application state, and you're going to have a better life. Um, the more logic you put into the view, the harder it is 
going to be for you to maintain that code. So, you know, that for me, that's kind of just like the a principle of design for me. Um, I know not everybody agrees with that, but that's what I find useful. And I think that that's, for me, you know, I don't see that, <clears throat> I see that the tests are, should be simpler on, in the in the front end of the code versus the back end code. The back end code will probably have many more business rules, but even then there are some constraints there. <clears throat> Keep your business rules as small and easy to understand and small components as possible, right? We're all about single responsibility principle here. So sorry to drag that on so long. I hope that answered the question. Um, yeah, I, sorry, David, give me a second. Um, I like that approach. I think uh, for me, one of the differences with front end, and when I say front end, I'm talking specifically about web applications, is that a lot of the code has to deal with uh, the obvious side effect of making changes to the DOM. So you have to choose to which extent you handle that or how you take care of it. Um, React seems to have taken the approach of saying, no, no, it's not a side effect. It's actually just pretend it's not there because my library is just this abstraction layer on top of it. So you can assume everything is just business logic, including just working with the DOM, which is not a bad way to do it. And if you're going in that direction, uh, I like the way you are doing it, are you? David? Yeah, I don't think there's that big of a difference between the bulk of the tests on the front end and the back end. You know, on the back end, you want to separate accessing the database layer from the business logic. On the front end, the same thing. You want to separate the API from the business logic and really focus on testing that business logic. Awesome. So let's move on to the next question. Um, how do you account for asynchronicities when testing node backends? Sorry, that's how do you account for asynchronous code? When testing node backends, that's the question that came in from the audience. I mean, it seems a bit like a trick question because if you would handle it, I would handle it the same way I handle asynchronous code on the front end. I move it somewhere to the side, and then if I absolutely have to have a callback to make sure it ends, that's what I do. But uh, I don't. I found that embracing it and making things very, very nested because you could and everything was asynchronous leads to very, very coupled in code and that is not easy to, uh, to decouple. Uh, so I, I prefer to just leave it as much as possible on the side. Conrad? I, I don't think I completely understand the question, but I'll give it a stab. So when I'm testing um, multi-threaded code, what I like to try and do is um, test the multi-threaded section in isolation. So I try and, if, if, if I've got to do any, spawn a new thread or something, I try and create a class whose sole responsibility will be to spawn that new thread uh, and delegate responsibility to something else. Um, and then it becomes a case of that new, that, that delegate then needs to, be uh, tested in a way, or, or designed rather in a way, such that its um, state uh, doesn't get shared between threads. Um, and I find that that makes it fun. Designing for that, designing for um, thread safetyness uh, is far easier if you don't have to worry about the threads, uh, spawning the threads and so on. Um, and that's, that's kind of similar to what I might do if I was uh, working with a Spring controller or a Java servlet, um, where you have multiple threads potentially going through the same um, servlet or the same Spring controller. All right. Yeah, think, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say there, there's that challenge of the the, the callback soup, which I think you know I'm not I don't work with Node, but I would assert that it's sort of like hey, look, people are like, hey, I'm firing off this message. It's going to do some work, and then there's some callback that's going to eventually get called back. Um, it's like, you know, as th there's a lot of different techniques that you can use to just keep track of it if you're trying to run the whole system together. I don't have specific advice for Node, but 
Um, when you you know, like Conrad, if you're doing something um, that has access to countdown latches, has access to um, polling facilities, try to leverage those things in your test cases. Well, we probably have time for one more question from the audience, which is, how does an agilist decide when to invest in test-driven development when the goal is rapid learning? Sorry, can you repeat that? How does um, an agilist decide when to invest in TDD when the goal is rapid learning? I wish I had some more information on what rapid learning means. Uh, it sounds a little like what Ariel mentioned earlier, which is if you're trying to just learn something, if you're playing with a library or something, then maybe uh, writing tests is not how you're going to get the learning because maybe the learning does not need the code to stick around afterwards. But I'm guessing because I'm not sure really what the uh, what, the, what the question means. Cool. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. Bob, did you want to say something real quick? Uh, I was just going to say real quick, if they mean learning in the context of, you know, like Lean Startup where you're trying to learn more about your customers, um, you know, if you have a product that you think, you know, you know might that they might be interested in, um, yeah, like if, if you're throwing up, uh, if you're testing, I don't know, uh, pricing for a product, and you're going to throw up four or five different landing pages and run some split tests on them. Yeah, that TDD is not going to not going to really help you there for that that type of learning. Uh, the point of TDD is to make it easy to change some stuff about your code without breaking other stuff about the code. So if there's something you think you're probably going to change, try not to nail it down with a lot of tests. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, on that note, we will wrap up the Hangout today. Thank you all so much for your time and sharing your thoughts and experience with us. Um, I will have another Hangout in another three weeks, so see you guys soon. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.